All right, so I would like to welcome back everyone. And um, just wanted to say that it was very great to hear from the experiences of patients um, and also to hear what the hospitals and the care, various care centers are doing across the province um, to improve the experiences of SCD patients presenting um, at the emergency department. Um, and uh, to continue with the conversation, uh, Mrs. Lanray will present on a study undertaken by SCAGO to identify hospitals that are in need of education to provide optimal care for patients living with sickle cell disease in Ontario. Um, uh, as some of us will know, Ms. Lanray is the president and CEO of SCAGO, so stands for the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario and is also the founding president and CEO of the Sickle Cell Disease Association of Canada. Uh, she is also a co-founder and the immediate past president um, and CEO of the Global Alliance of Sickle Cell Disease Organizations. Her passion for sickle cell, disease, sickle cell advocacy um, stems from a personal instance hitting close to home. And um, in the late 90s, her brother, Sunday Afolabi, suffered from avoidable and treatable complications of sickle cell. And that led to his preventable and premature death. This propelled her, or this propelled, propelled within her a passionate interest in patient quality access care. So from that time on, she immersed herself in community health advocacy and research initiatives. So uh, Mrs. Lenray, um, just let me know when you're ready and then feel free to um, go on and present um, on the research report. Thank you very much, Ms. Marie Prosperco for that very warm and kind introduction. Um, can you see the screen with um, what um, Kala has shared? Did you see that screen, the yes. abstract? Okay, wonderful. So that's what we're going to present today. So um, Kalaya, are you able to make it bigger a little bit so people can see it better? Okay, no, it's kind of zooming out. Okay, no worries. That's fine. We'll make do what we have. So I wanted to say that in 2019, um, the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario um, due to the many, many uh, uh, feedback from patients and their family members around the quality of care that they do receive in Ontario hospitals um, and providing those feedback to schedule led us to embark on what we call a more formal approach in you know, putting the patient perspectives on the quality of care and that they do receive in Ontario hospitals together. So in 2019, we embark on that project. We closed the project in February um, 2020. So I'm going to provide a little bit of background. But first of all, I want to recognize um, that um, Dr. Susan Williams um, was supposed to co-present this with myself today. And she has put this abstract together with a few tweaks from myself. And so I want to thank her that while she's not able to present today, uh, we're still able to um, share this abstract with everybody. So in collaboration with CKIDS, Dr. Melanie Corby, um, and Dr. Suzanne from CKIDS, in collaboration with Dr. Madeline Verhovsek from McMaster University, and also she also represents Hamilton Health Center, um, and also Dr. Jennifer Bryan from UHN. Uh, I believe we did a good job in collecting the patient perspectives as you'll find. So the background, we know that sickle cell disease is an inherited multi-organ disorder. And we know that its complications can be acute and also chronic. Um, as you know, about 6,000 people have sickle cell disease in Canada and 3,500 of them, which is translates to about 58.3% live in the province of Ontario. We also know that um, a lot of the hospital visits of individuals with sickle cell disease, um, you know, um, you know, end up in emergency care. And again, like we we're saying, could it also be um, something that we need to look about? Could it also be of uh, something of concern? Um, why are patients more and more ending up in emergency department? And overall, this study is again looking at the patient perspective of the quality of care that they have received 
in order to help us to identify um, areas for improvement. So um, now the study design, um, sorry, give me one second. And it should be, good. In the study design, about 49 questions um, were provided via SurveyMonkey and it was shared through different outlets, um, Skegos newsletter, the WhatsApp group, other sickle cell associations. And again, between July 2019 and February 2020, we collected about 66 uh, um, responses from the sickle cell community. How do we interpret the uh, data that we collected. So we kind of define the care type based number one on the time frame within which the care is provided and number two on the quality of care that the patient is telling us that they have received. So we, we code the narratives as either optimal care is received or suboptimal care is received. So if um, care um, is received by the patient um, within 30 minutes um, after triage or 16 minutes after registration. Um, and if the patient believes that they have received the right dosage of pain medication um, or treatment at the, and promptly at the right time. And also if the, L, if, the, if the patient or their caregiver believe that the health care provider that attended to them were respectful, then we will call that experience as optimal. Where the patient or their care provider um, did not get forced analgesia um, within 30 minutes of, of being triaged and or 60 minutes of showing up in the hospital and registering, or if they do not think that they have received the right medication or the right dosage, and you do not think that the healthcare providers were respectful of their needs and concerns, then that will be coded as suboptimal. In terms of results, um, again, about 66 people completed the survey, uh, and 64 of them are female, 36 of them are male. But in the age range of those who responded were um, typically 18 to 64 years of age. Um, and those who are not within that age, the, their responses were inputted by their parents or other caregivers. Um, it, so typically um, you find that in the questions that we ask, not everyone answered all questions because we didn't make any, we didn't make it compulsory that you have to answer all questions. We want you to answer what you're comfortable answering. And so I believe the highest number of questions answered by one individual is 38, and the least question answered is five, but it still gave us a good opportunity to understand the quality of care that the patients in the province are receiving. So it's very, it's very interesting um, to know that uh, in terms of location of the, um, you know, of presentation, in the, in the um, hospital, um, you find that while we have a good amount of people, um, about 20 who did not, um, about 20% did not indicate where in the hospital they have, you know, you know their, their point of presentation in the hospital, we find that for those who did indicate emergency room, is, the, um, is where they are showing up a lot. And again, in my mind, that is something that we need to, uh, you know, to deal with. Why are they showing up in the emergency? Um, it shouldn't be comprehensive care, I, I believe is the way for this disease. And so showing up in emergency shouldn't be. So you find those who are showing up in outpatient and in admissions, are way less, emergency is high. Now, if you look at the hospitals that um, are indicated in the study, um, you find that Toronto, um, many of the hospitals in the Toronto area are, the, are, the, are very much where the, a lot of the patients that 
did complete the survey, have visiting, even though we also have Brampton, Etobicoke, Kitchener, Oshawa, London, and Mississauga. I also want to mention that even though some hospitals are not mentioned here by the, by the respondents, it doesn't mean that these are all the hospitals that are visited because about 23 of the respondents did not indicate which hospitals they have gone to receive care. And this could also be to, it could be due to fear of, you know, a backlash because again, they provided their name and they, they, they may not want to, you know, have any sort of a backlash uh, to affect their care. Um, because I find that out of 666 respondents, 23 not indicating which hospital they have showed up is also uh, very alarming. So when you look at the time to assessment, we have provided the different colors um, as you will find in the horizontal bar. Um, you find the, the, the blue uh, representing if they are, if the time that it takes them to be assessed is less than five minutes. The green is five to 15 minutes. Nursing, um, yellow is 15 to 30 minutes. Um, orange is 30 to 60 minutes and red is more than 60 minutes. Now, when you look at the physician contact, for instance, majority of the respondents, um, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, physicians did not uh, connect with them um, under the 60 minutes that is provided in the clinical handbook. So, and then also, um, when you're looking at the nursing contact also a higher number of percentage of the respondents, about 30%, um, felt that the nurses did not connect with them um, on a timely manner. It's way more than 60 minutes before they got a nurse to connect with them. Um, and you will see that, um, you know, it's the same thing also for the administration of medication. Um, again, it's way more than 60 minutes before they get their first analgesia. Even though the recommendation is the first analgesia should be administered within 60 minutes. Um, so that's something I wanted to really um, put our attention to. Um, even though I find for the nursing contact, um, I, you know, it, it, rightly following it is about 15 to 13 minutes which is, you know, um, which is not bad compared to uh, when you think about the physician contact um, and you think also about the administration of medication. Now, when, you, when we talk about, when we ask them, how do you feel about the, um, your experience, right? In the quality of care that you have received, does it meet your expectation? 54% um, of the individuals that complete this um, survey, this particular question, um, advise us that the quality of care they have received, um, you know, did not meet expectation, is below expectation. That is more than half. And 34%, 34%, uh, you know, felt like, okay, it's somehow, uh, you know, meet some expectation and 12% um, feels that it exceeded their expectation. Now, one thing that we need to bear in mind here is that the 34% and the 12% that felt that um, the quality of care they have received did meet um, expectation or exceeded expectation are more in the pediatric setting and the 54% more in the, um, more in the um, adult setting. So again, I think that is also iterating what we've been hearing today, um, you know, that um, the quality of care that the adults are receiving in Ontario, uh, majority of the respondents did not think that it is optimal for them. Now, when we go to interaction with the first person encountered, I find this to be very, um, you know, very encouraging. And I'll tell you why, because um, when you look at the 
um, you know, the horizontal bar, you can see that the green line, you can see that all, a good percentage of the respondents uh, believe that the care providers that have connected with them are caring, um, empathetic, and respectful. And as we know, with um, sickle cell care, the first person you encounter is also very important. So we find about 65% or so there um, believes that um, the, 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 the first respondent, which may likely, which will be the triage nurse and those that they first meet uh, are caring, they are empathetic and they are respectful, right? We can always, we, we can also see that about 35% and neutral, so they not they can't really say if uh, the first person they encounter was caring, empathetic, or respectful. But again, um, they are they are neutral, and we also have um, you know about uh, twelve percent who said that they don't know. Uh, but again, it's encouraging that a good number of the patient felt that the first person encountered you know, he's caring. So when we ask the question around responsiveness of healthcare workers to needs, um, we find that um, about 18% um, felt that the healthcare workers, well, which include the healthcare professionals, the doctors and all that um, attend to them uh, were extremely responsive to their concerns and their needs. Um, and you find that about, I would say about 12% felt that the healthcare providers are very responsive. And but a larger number at about 45% um, feel that the healthcare workers are somewhat responsive and uh, to a lesser degree at about 22% um, um, uh, final you know, are minimally responsive. And so um, somewhat responsive is the um, response of those who have completed this uh, question. When we ask about negative experience during treatment, um, again, the, the green line means no, um, yellow means don't know, um, the blue is neutral and the red is yes. When we ask about the negative experience during treatment, we find that um, while majority did not provide, especially for when we talk about stereotyping, um, you find that majority um, chose green at about 50% of those who answered that question and they do not feel like they have been stereotyped. And also when you think about the fear of dying, about 45% do not have the fear of dying due to maybe a negative experience during treatment. And I would say also about 12% do not feel helpless and lonely. However, when you talk about helplessness and loneliness, a high percentage um, at about 40 something percent there, felt that they were airplace, they were lonely, because I guess they were not receiving the right care at the right time. And um, again, about 22% were afraid of dying. And in terms of stereotype, it's also at about 22%. However, um, again, you know, we find varying uh, our responses um, from the respondents on how they feel. Um, thinking back on this study um, and reading, you know, the uh, responses from the respondents, I recollected one of the patients um, expressing that they felt, like they actually felt that no one cared, that no one cared uh, because nobody was listening and they felt very, very helpless and very, very lonely, um, um, you know, while being in, the, in that um, situation in that particular hospital. Um, so um, that is something that I think we need to pause and think about to say, you know, taking care of the patient, um, we need to consider also their emotional 
state as well, you know, how they're feeling, um, you know, at that time, am I doing enough for them to ensure that they are feeling safe, you know, in that space? Um, when we asked the question, was healthcare workers knowledgeable, um, about 20% felt that the healthcare workers were extremely knowledgeable, about 40% felt that the healthcare worker was, was very knowledgeable, and about 30% had somewhat knowledgeable, and about 10% uh, at not at all. So again, um, this um, is relative to each individual, which hospital they've been to and the care that they have received. So to conclude this, um, we came to a few conclusions. Number one, we uh, are able to identify um, areas for potential improvement for sickle cell disease care in hospitals. Uh, one of the main areas is wait times. If you can see um, right here, time to assess. Um, again, to get to see the physician, to get a nurse contact, to even get medication, were way over 60 for most of the respondents. Um, so wait times to receive care is one of the areas we've identified. We also identified that healthcare providers need to be more responsive um, to uh, patient needs. As you find here, somewhat um, is what we find that majority are saying. So it's not, it's, it's, it's fear, but we, there could be improvement here. Um, and also to be aware that, you know, um, you know, the negative experiences, how also it is impacting the patient, you know, during care and treatment is very, important. We also wanted to identify the limitations of the study. There is a low number of respondents and we are not sure it could also be due to the fact that people um, have to, uh, you know, there was, a, there was some questions in there with people providing their names and people may be afraid, as you know, with sickle cell disease, there's a lot of stigma and bias and stuff like that. And, and we find that individuals with lived sickle cell experience are very cognizant of, and many times worry about, will this get back to my healthcare providers and will that impact the quality of the care we receive next? So um, there was low number of respondents, right? And so that is one of the things that we did notice um, in, this, um, in this study. And some of our next steps is what, what we did. So after we put the, uh, the summary and the result together, we connected with different hospitals in Ontario. So we did not just connect with the hospitals who were identified in the study alone. We connected with hospitals across the province to um, provide them with a summary of the study and also to, um, to you know, um, discuss with them what they're doing to improve the quality of sickle cell care in Ontario, and also asking them what can they do more based on the narratives of the Ontario sickle cell patient community. And so we did that. And based on the narratives, we know that many of the Ontario hospitals are working very hard to even improve what they are currently doing. We also met with the Ministry of Ontario and we presented to the Ministry of Ontario the gaps in care and how the gaps needs to be, um, needs to be um, addressed. And one of the things that we recommended to the Ministry of Ontario was to also have um, to, to provide funding um, to, you know, for more resources for the uh, five, for five um, of the sickle cell centers of excellence that we have in Ontario that currently um, have needs around staffing. So um, I know the Ministry of Health is working with the hospitals in terms of that. And so that is one of the things that we've done. And we also wanted to follow up with you, the sickle cell community, and you know, by bringing the, the, um, our healthcare providers, our hospitals in this um, summit, with you today to help you understand what the hospitals are doing to improve you know, the quality um, of care that they provide 
to you when you do go to the hospitals. Uh, and you can find as per the presentations over the last two days, the hospitals have been sharing, you know, what, they, you know, what they're doing um, to improve the quality of care. Um, again, we have, you know, again, as mentioned, there is improvement strategies that the hospitals uh, have been putting together and they're sharing that with you today. And we also encourage um, this continued dialogue and we will continue as an organization to follow up with the hospitals in partnership, of course, with you, um, you know, the patient community to ensure that um, the, the, the care that we provide in this province, we want to make Ontario, you know, you know, that model of care, right? The sickle cell care in Ontario as a model for the country and for many countries um, to ensure that we have stalwart program that would be the heavy um, of sickle cell program, you know, not only in Canada, but I would say globally. And I know we can do it by working together. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Mrs. Larry. And um, I would also like to thank the Chicago team, uh, the Chicago research team, and um, all the various institutions that have helped to um, put this uh, research together in this report um, and on collecting the data that um, really confirms the experiences that has been recounted by our various um, community members in the sickle cell disease community um, on the type of uh, on the type of care that they receive um, when they present at the emergency room. Um, uh, I would like to uh, use this time to um, move to the Q&A se session, recognizing that um, uh, keeping in mind time. So um, maybe we'll just have time for just one or two questions. But um, Mrs. Lanray, I just wanted to know, um, and I also welcome uh, the various participants also, if they have any questions to type them in the chat. But um, just one question for you, Mrs. Lanray, just wanted to know, um, after presenting the research study to the hospitals, what are the types of, um, like what has been the reaction or the attitude of the hospitals that you have been presenting the study to? Um, thank you, Ms. Poco. So I can tell you that um, every hospital we met me, that we met with have been um, very, number one, they were very eager to, uh, when, I, when, I do, when I do request for meetings with them, they were very eager to meet and to learn about the study. And that itself is very encouraging. We all, and all of the hospitals that we do meet with um, were very humble to recognize where um, they could be improving, where they need to improve. And, and I know that many of them started to actively work um, from that meeting um, you know, work even harder. I know they've been doing great work before, but they're working harder to improve the quality of care. For instance, not York shared yesterday, and uh, we met with them. We have patient, uh, we presented the patient experience and everything with as relates to their hospital. And right away, they wanted to meet with the patient if possible, and they wanted to, you know, to see what they can do. And they did a good job um, creating different new programs. So, and so many other hospitals that we met with. So in general, I would say that the hospitals were responsive and they um, started to work to improve what they're doing. So it's been very good uh, responses from all of the hospitals that we did meet with. Thank you. All right, thank you for sharing that. And um, I don't think we have any other questions from uh, participants, but I would like to ask another question. Um, and this, I know the conversation so far has been revolving around um, hospitals uh, and what hospitals are doing. However, I just wanted to know, um, to what extent do you think that governments and you know our political leaders can be useful um, to ensure that hospitals and care centers um, continue to deliver adequate services to people with sickle cell disease? And also like what role that, that, it can, that the government can play to bridge the gap between the quality of services um, that are provided by local hospitals versus what is provided by major health centers? I know we spoke about a little bit about 
funding that's needed, but wondering if you have any other thoughts on what um, what other supports that the government can deliver to fulfill that. Thank you so much, Ms. Poco. Um, I wanted to say one thing. Sickle cell disease is relatively uh, new in Canada, right? So, um, and again, it's a, it's, it doesn't affect majority of Canadians. So it's considered a minority health issue. So this is where advocacy is important, right? So because otherwise they don't know what your needs are, they don't know what it is. And then if you think about it as a politician, uh, you may typically want to put resources or funding or support in areas that may get you reelected because if you have more people, you know, maybe a, maybe a disease like diabetes or high blood pressure that do affect more Canadians, right? So we, we know and we recognize that sickle cell is rare. And this is why we intensify advocacy to ensure that our voices are also heard. And we've been working with the ministry of it for many years, but I can tell you that this administration is listening. And we've had many meetings with them and we continue to have meetings with them. They are working with us to ensure that Canadian health, um, sorry, I would say provincial, Ontario, health care providers are held accountable on the quality of care that they do provide. Now, to make them accountable, they must first know what is the right care. They need to know, right? Before you start to hold them accountable. And this is why we, we are working with the ministry to make sure that the clinical handbook for treating sickle cell disease and all their standard of care guidelines, like the Ken Himstad uh, statement, um, you know, on sickle cell care and so on becomes, you know, routine that every health care provider in the province knows about, right? And, and so having that quality care. And yesterday, I know at the session, yes, one of the sessions yesterday, we talked about maybe even having um, some kind of a poster in emergency and the inpatient and so on can also help to remind care providers on the, the right care at the right time to provide. So it's something that we all have to work together. And I'm very grateful that, you know, um, since the summit started yesterday, we have Ministry of Health representatives on, on every session hearing and listening, uh, because it's very, very important um, that we work with them, right? We work with them and they, ha they are listening. We are having meetings um, in order to ensure that you know, we improve the quality of care. So with the patient community, the care provider community, and also the government um, who will help to bring about the right policies and make the right changes to happen in the system, um, the health system leaders, uh, I believe um, we will move sickle cell to the next level from where we currently are. Thank you. All right, thank you for your answer. I will take one more question. And uh, that's coming from the participants who, one of, the, of our participants who's asking if there's work being done in supporting those with sickle cell and their family members emotionally, mental health um, in those centers that currently don't have the support. Is it possible to start to have the social workers in the hospitals doing more to support not only in hospital, but also in community care? Um, sorry, so this individual is asking um, if we can have social worker not only in the hospitals but also in community care. Yes. Um, when there's the community care, are you referring like in community health centers or like what are they referring to? I'm assuming maybe just, um, I guess, in advocacy, like people that, for example, in uh, communities or adv uh, advocacy organizations, like. Yeah. that um, people with sickle cell disease are involved in. I yeah. Think. yeah. So again, it all comes to resources, right? So, um, but it's a great advocacy uh, effort. And to be honest with you, even some of our centers right now don't even have a full-time social worker. So let's start from there. Uh, the Centers of Excellence, supposed to provide comprehensive care for individuals with sickle cell disease. And we wanted to make sure that those centers are adequately uh, equipped with the right staff resources. Again, like I mentioned earlier, uh, patients showing up in emergency is not right. This is not where we need to be showing up. If patients do receive comprehensive 
adequate care, there will be less uh, uh, reasons to go to the emerge department, right? So having the comprehensive care centers, have social workers, have nurses, have all of those, I think is very, is very, is very, very important. And that is what we are doing right now, advocate, uh, advocating with the Ministry of Health to ensure that every center has full-time nurse, full-time social worker, full-time, you know, hematologist to support the patient care, right? Once we get that, then we can we can seek for more resources, right? So, you know, you you take one, you deal with it. And then once you receive that, then you ask for more. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to say, I think there are more questions coming in, but again, due to the interest of time, we'll have to move uh, to the other section or segment of our summit. So um, thank you so much again, Ms. Lenry, for presenting the report. And I will actually move it, pass it back to you to um, introduce the next set, of, next set of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Ms. Poco. And so I just want to say that please keep those questions coming. We can provide answers to some of your questions at the latter time if we don't get to address them right away. So we will take note of all of those questions in the chat and we will um, respond to everyone. Thank you. So I'd like to introduce my co-moderator for the afternoon session, uh, Dr. Dana Powell. Dr. Dana Powell um, is a board member of the SCAGO, as I mentioned earlier, and she has written about hate publications, very, very interested in ensuring that sickle cell care in Ontario is optimal. So welcome, Dr. Diana Powell, as my co-host this afternoon. Um, our group three hospitals this afternoon, um, I believe her... Um, sorry, group four hospital this afternoon will be University Health Network Hospital for the Kids. And we also have Dr. Derek Chan, uh, formerly of the Michael G. DeGroat School of Medicine at McMaster University, who will also be presenting on his project on evaluating health resources utilization patterns in sickle cell disease in emergency department in Ontario, which I'm proud to say that Skego was a co-sponsor of, uh, of this project um, that Dr. Derek Jan did um, about two years ago. Without taking much of your time, I would like to introduce the members from the University Health Network. We have Ms. Ruth Apia, Boteng, who's a registered nurse, Dr. Jennifer Bryan, an emergency physician, uh, Ms. Kathleen Azubuk, who is a social worker, and we also have Ms. Jane Ballantyne, um, who's also from the patient relations. She's a manager of the patient relations at um, UHN, and we have Ms. Sintu um, Sri, um, Sri Katan, who is also a social worker working at the Red Blood Cell Disorder Clinic at the UHN. Just a point of correction there, Kathleen Asabuki is maybe a social worker, but she actually works with Jane Ballantyne in patient relations. So we would let the University Health Network do their presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lanray, for the introduction. Um, it's been another fantastic day at the summit today. Um, I continue to take notes um, as I'm listening to all these great ideas. Um, I'm going to um, uh, be working the slides in the background. I'll be speaking a little bit later on, um, but I'm going to turn things over um, to my team members. Um, and Cynthia, would you like to get us started? Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't actually see Sindhu on the, the chat right now. Um, we might go ahead to, um, to Jane and Caitlin's portion um, uh, while she's getting connected.
All right, Jane and Caitlin, would you like to get started? Sure, yeah, no problem. Uh, Caitlin, are you there too? I think we, for some reason, we're both signed in under the same name, but I think she's changed that now. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Uh, Cynthia is actually typing in the chat. She's asking if we can hear her. So I don't know if there's an issue with the, the microphone. I can start, um, but just wanted to let you know that I think she's trying to <laughs> get connected. There. Great, okay. Um, why don't you go ahead and then Sindhu, once your, your mic is working, you can join us again. Oh, hi everyone, I'm here. We can yeah, hear you. Sorry. Okay, great. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so hi everyone, um, my name is Sindhu and I'm a social worker in the Red Blood Cell Disorders Clinic at UHN. Um, so just wanted to give you a little bit of context about um, UHN. Um, so the Red Blood Cell Disorders Clinic is the largest sickle cell clinic in Canada um, and it's the second largest in North America. So we serve a lot of patients across the GTA with diverse backgrounds and life experiences. Um, and at our clinic, we have an interdisciplinary team to deliver the comprehensive care. Um, so we have hematologists, we have two nurse practitioners, we have one social worker, myself, um, and we also have a transition navigator who's helping um, young patients come in over from sick kids. You go to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to briefly discuss the role of social work. Um, so generally social work, we are, you know, um, social change profession um, and we work towards empowerment. Um, we work with individuals, groups, families and communities and our core practices include um, relationship building, holistic assessments, um, emotional support and advocacy. Um, and when you think about the role of social work in sickle cell care, um, we address the social needs as part of the comprehensive care model. Um, so some of my work includes help navigating community resources, programs, and systems. Um, I provide mental health support as well as linkages to the community to, so for help dealing with anxiety and depression. Um, I also support patients um, dealing with um, different life transitions, such as coping with illness, grief, um, navigating school, employment, and relationships. Um, and then advocacy, as I had mentioned, is a huge role. So helping people, um, you know, really get the resources, the benefits um, that they're entitled to and making sure that they get equitable um, uh, care and treatment in, in different systems in healthcare as well as in other um, places in society as well. So um, that's just a bit about my work. I'm going to transition it to um, Caitlin as well as Jane to talk about their work in patient relations. Hey, so hi there, everyone. Uh, my name is Caitlin Ezebwicki, and I am a patient relations advisor with the University Health Network, and I'm joined by my manager, Jane Ballantyne. Um, and the purpose of our presentation today is just to really go over some of the data uh, that has been reported to our office by our sickle cell population at UHN, uh, and then to discuss the ways that patient relations can assist sickle cell patients um, on their hospital care journey. Uh, but I think overall, our goal today in attending the summit and the panel discussion is really to gather suggestions and recommendations from the patients with lived experience, families, and staff um, on how we can continue to improve our service. Because um, I know our name has kind of been mentioned a, a few times in the session and, and in the chat. So um, I just like to start off quickly by explaining why we have a patient relations process. And I'll try to go through the slides uh, quite quickly and get to the data and um, some case examples. Um, so we have a patient relations process in the hospital so that patients can share their feedback, compliments and complaints. Um, we're able to provide education, navigation and support to patients around the hospital system and also with the hospital staff. Um, we're also a, uh, a department to provide a process for conflict resolution, where we, again, we are supporting both the patient and the staff to come to a resolution um, within the clinics and the inpatient units. Uh, we also are able to collect data about patient satisfaction, and that, of course, can help to improve uh, opportunities for improvement within the hospital that are related to patient experience and safety. 
Um, and then we are governed by the uh, Excellent Care for All Act, and that's the legislation uh, that states that every hospital in Ontario must have a process that reflects uh, the patient declaration of values. I don't know if you can see it there, but um, we just have a little photo there of our uh, uh, patient declaration of values that we follow at UHN. Um, and how to contact uh, patient relations within the hospital. So we accept uh, phone calls. You can email as well. Um, we also take staff consultations. So Synthu in the uh, Sickle Cell Clinic also sends referrals to our office when she has spoken to a sickle cell patient who would like to report either a concern or some feedback, Synthu will reach out to me and I can connect with the patient that way. So I think that's important to note that um, not only patients can come to us, but staff can come to us as well for staff consults um, on how to improve uh, their service with the sickle cell population. So what do patients tell us? So in patient relations, we engage with about 350 patients every month um, or about 4,000 patients per year from across all of our UHN sites. So Toronto General, Toronto Western, Princess Margaret and Toronto Rehab. Uh, a little under half of that number are what we consider to be a formal complaint. Um, or someone that's bringing forward their care experience that they had within the hospital. Uh, and then about 30 to 40% of the cases are uh, patients that are just looking for support navigating the healthcare system and UHN uh, because it is such a, a large institution. Um, the issues that are raised are mainly around communication with staff, uh, treatment related concerns um, related to respect and compassion, uh, care coordination and wait times within the hospital, so especially within the emergency departments. Uh, in the last four to five years, we've only heard from about 40 patients who stated that they have sickle cell disease. We have seen an increase in the last year, which we hope is related to the work that uh, we've been doing with the Sickle Cell Working Group and with SCAGO. Um, so we have had an increase in calls and emails. Um, I'll also credit Synthu for that because um, she sent me uh, quite a few referrals as well. So that's been really helpful. Um, many of the complaints that we receive are related to the emergency department and the de general internal medicine units. Um, and they usually involve issues related to, as we've heard many times today, they're usually related to pain crisis uh, and response time from the staff on managing pain. Uh, and then also around disrespectful or uncompassionate communication by the care providers. So I did want to go over uh, just one uh, case example of a patient who came into our emergency department um, that I was involved with. So the uh, patient arrived in our emergency department with their partner. Um, this was unfortunately during COVID. So of course the patient's partner could not come into the emergency department with the patient. Um, so they attempted to, the partner attempted to provide suggestions to the nursing staff on how to manage the patient's pain. Um, because they had developed a plan together as partners on the things that really help him in the moment. At this time, the patient was in so much pain that he couldn't even communicate his own needs. So he did need his partner there for support. Um, the patient's partner really felt that she was kind of being pushed off to the side, not heard by the staff when she was trying to communicate these suggestions. There was mention that the patient didn't look like he was in a lot of pain, um, even though he was in so much pain that they actually eventually had to bring in a wheelchair. Um, so th ultimately the par partner felt as though she was being dismissed and she ended up contacting our office for assistance. Um, so this patient goes through a lot of what our patients go through in that they come through the emergency department and in some cases are eventually admitted to the general internal medicine unit. Um, so what I did as a patient relations advisor was reach out to the general internal medicine unit as well as the ED and let them know that there was some communication issues between the nursing staff and the patient and his partner. 
Uh, I communicated the suggestions that the partner gave for managing the patient's pain. And then I tried my best to link the emergency, emergency department staff with the general medicine staff. So there was that continuity of care. Um, I also reached out to the uh, social worker on general medicine who was able to then follow up with the patient and his partner. Um, and she kind of continued the advocacy from there. So um, this is something that we hear a lot in patient relations that a patient will come in, feel that they're not being heard, feel that their pain is not being managed adequately, uh, and they really need someone to be there to advocate for them. I think part of the issue comes with patients not always knowing that we exist um, and therefore um, not knowing who to reach out to. Uh, I will also go over some of the reasons why they may not reach out to our office. Um, but uh, I would say the main reason being they either don't know that we are there or uh, they're hesitant to come forward and put in a complaint, of course, for fear of repercussions. So, um, just looking ahead at some of our goals in patient relations and, and with the sickle cell working group, um, we know that even though we have a low amount of data for the amount of patients who reach out to us, that of course doesn't mean that these issues aren't occurring on a regular basis. Um, we, so we need to really figure out what the reasons are for why the patients are apprehensive to reach out to us and then address those accordingly so that patients feel more comfortable reaching out. Um, we need to look at ways in which we can make our process more transparent, uh, supportive, equitable, and accessible so that patients can really feel comfortable speaking up for their own safety. Um, and I, again, I, I know this has come up a few times today uh, within the session, but uh, we understand that patients may feel comfortable coming forward to share with our office. Um, so one thing that uh, I have discussed as well with the working group is the idea of uh, anonymous complaints. Um, so that's come up quite a few times. I think we're, Jane and I are now looking for further suggestions, recommendations, especially when we're on the panel discussion, um, looking for ways in which we can continue to improve and to um, make the patients more comfortable. So any, any type of suggestions or recommendations are welcome. Um, and so that we can incorporate that into our process. And so the last slide there, I think just has our uh, email address. So anyone, please feel free to reach out to us directly at any time, uh, even if it's after the, the conference, just to give any uh, recommendations, suggestions. If you have questions, we'll do our best to answer those. Um, we just really look forward to uh, hearing your perspective and especially the patients with lived experience. Uh, I think we would love to know um, you know, any recommendations from them on, on how we can improve. So uh, I think going forward, we, we've kind of done our best working with the working group, but we still have a long ways to go. So I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that and um, looking forward to the panel discussion. All right, thank you so much, and Caitlin and Sindhu and Jane in the background there. Um, uh, we're gonna be talking briefly about the emergency department next. I'm also keeping an eye on the time. Um, I wanna make sure we do have some um, time for, for questions um, uh, at the end. Um, a year ago, um, almost to the day, many of you here joined UHN and Skago for our very first collaborative um, patient provider forum um, with the emergency department. Um, at that time, we made a commitment to keep building community and to keep working toward improving care for people living with sickle cell disease. Our goals were to focus on building a partnership, create a standardized order set that aligned with the clinical handbook, and complete education sessions. And what Ruth mentioned around community partnership was really the core of this for us. And that's what we've been hearing really in the past, um, these past two days of the summit. Um, so we reached out to patients, we reached out to, um, to advocacy groups. Um, so the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario um, and the Sickle Cell Association of Ontario as well. Our AD working group consists of 
our emergency nurses and physicians, as well as our social worker, patient advocates, the SCAGO and SCAO organization, as well as our patient relations. We have about monthly meetings uh, to continuously improve and refine our care for our Sickasaw community. And we, we wanna provide good equitable health care. And we've had a lot of discussions over the past couple of days about order set. Um, uh, we've been using an order set at UHN for a number of years, but we knew that there was a lot of room for improvement there, um, and that we had um, specific concerns uh, from patients that we'd like to see incorporated. Um, if our order set is helpful um, uh, to anyone in the process, there is a link at the bottom of the screen and you can use the QR code as well to have a look and see what, what we've been working on. Um, so the order set to the revision um, was approved um, just in September. Some of the highlights for the changes are an explicit statement around that 30 minute target um, for analgesia. Um, we know that we are not there or close to there yet. Um, and like Dr. Verhovsek um, said, this in some ways can be an aspirational goal, but it's still a very important goal for us. Um, we included a statement about non-pharmacologic coping strategies. Um, so hearing again and again, um, uh, including um, in Fitzanne's um, talk this morning um, about misconceptions around what pain looks like, right? So um, how um, people would be seen on their phones or computers or eating a sandwich um, and will be documented as saying, you know, looks well, not having any pain. Um, but again, what we know is that um, if we're not asking, we just don't know what people are feeling. Um, so support for non-pharmacologic coping strategies and recognizing those as an important um, modality for managing pain um, was important. Um, we also wanted to include a clear statement um, that only patients who feel ready to go home should be discharged from the emergency department. And so that's to encourage that conversation right from the beginning um, to, to make it clear um, to patients that, that they have power over what's going to be happening to them in the emergency department. Our education session objectives were to have our patient advocates provide emergency education to our emergency staff by sorry by um, sharing their perspective of their lived experiences of how it is when they're having a pain crisis and coming to the emergency department. We wanted to create awareness. We wanted to decrease stigma, um, judgments, and misconceptions that they were having. And we wanted to encourage the use of the order set even before the physician sees the patient. And of course, lastly, as Ms. Dr. Bryan said, highlight the importance of administering analgesia within a timely matter of 30 minutes. Unfortunately, the pandemic raised a lot of barriers for our working group um, to overcome, one being the inability to actually have our patient advocates come to the emergency department, and two, we couldn't have large group um, education sessions. So what we ended up doing is we worked in collaboration with both managers at Toronto General and at the Toronto Western site. Each morning, the managers have a morning rounds with the staff where they talk about safety concerns, change in policy and procedures, and any concerns that the staff may have. So they allow a lot us about 15 to 20 minutes where we were able to create awareness, promote the use of the order set, and even have a Q&A period for the staff to ask our patient advocates some questions. Um, as well, in addition to that, we were able to get our nurse educator to add um, sickle cell into the new higher education um, when they come to the emergency department. This is a picture of myself and Serena Thompson, who is a member of the SCAO uh, uh, organization. And so that's how we actually did our virtual uh, education sessions. In reality, um, what ended up happening is we were successful at reaching 72% of our nursing staff at the Toronto General site. And we were able to reach about 19% of our staff at Toronto Western. Um, we were successful at creating awareness among our allied healthcare professionals, such as our social worker, our gem nurse, and our consulting physicians. Um, but most importantly, we wanted to create word of mouth and increase awareness um, within our department. We recognize that we have a lot of work to do and that we're just touching the surface of this. Um, and we realize that the same amount of time that it, need, it takes to build these unconscious biases requires the same amount of time for them to change. 
So in addition to the, the huddle education sessions that Ruth was talking about, we also held a grand round, um, again, involving our um, uh, patient um, partners um, in having a direct, um, uh, um, uh, a, a direct discussion about um, firsthand experiences. Um, we also um, uh, participated in teaching session for over a thousand students um, from health disciplines at University of Toronto. Um, this was the first time that the Center for the Study of Pain had included a sickle cell talk um, in their sessions um, on chronic pain and pain management. Um, and so these are a thousand future physicians, nurses, physiotherapists, pharmacists um, who are going to know that much much more about sickle cell um, than they would have had they done their training even a couple of years ago. Now I'm going to invite um, our student Marcus, um, who um, is an example of this very um, exciting future of medicine, to talk a little bit about the, the quality improvement project um, and the baseline data that he has to share. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Um, so in order to appreciate and communicate kind of the impact that, that the work that we just discussed um, may have, we need to understand where we're coming from. And this, re this, is a, this research is really just showing some of the numbers that, uh, that highlight where UHN is at when it comes to providing timely analgesia. And this summer, we looked at 20, 228 emergency medicine encounters uh, uh, spanning about a year time before the pandemic began, and this included 98 patients, about half of them were female, uh, uh, and the rest were male. And what we saw was about 50% uh, or a little under 50% of the patients uh, were um, received a, a triage score less than two, and we know the clinical handbook recommends that uh, patients receive a triage level of uh, two, which deems them emergent. And this is an area of improvement that we could possibly look at. When it came to uh, uh, the time to analgesia, we noticed that only 5% of the people actually met that 30 minute mark uh, 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 that we were speaking and, and the rest of the uh, encounters that we looked at were above that. And the average wait time to receiving analgesia was 103 minutes. Um, and uh, another thing that we saw, which we're going to study, is if 50, half of those encounters actually receive opioids before even seeing uh, a doctor. So if these people receive their opioids quicker, then maybe this is an area that we could also look at for improvements. Um, and uh, lastly, I want to just say that the next steps is we're going to compare some, we're going to compare our sickle cell population to other pain presentations in the emergency room. Uh, and to see if we're doing worse or uh, or the same, and determine uh, the and use this as the baseline for future uh, the future changes that we're making to see where we're coming from. Excellent. Thank you, Marcus. Um, so we're very excited about the, the next steps of this project to help us understand um, where we want to be. We need to understand where we are. And so um, that's the starting point. Um, and hopefully with much more to come um, in the coming months to years. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, and I'm looking forward to the questions in the Q&A. Amazing. Thank you very much to the UHN team. Um, today we've seen uh, from um, all of the panelists from a UHN how there's an interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, and it's great hearing from social work, patient relationship, um, the healthcare providers, in addition to um, seeing the importance for patient advocacy, um, in addition to seeing how the team has incorporated research into making certain decisions and, and driving forces for improvement moving forward. Um, it was really amazing to hear about the new higher education and the huddles, and um, we commend you. And we're super excited also about the collaborative forum that you um, have shared with Skago um, a year ago and uh, moving forward, what we can do as 
a team. Um, so thank you very much for every member of this panelist who shared from your chance. So moving on um, to our Sick Kids um, Hospital speakers today, I would love to welcome um, to the platform uh, Dr. Ann Fuller, who is a pediatrician, and Dr. Melanie Kirkby Allen, co-director of hemoglobinopathy program in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at SickKids. So um, please feel free to turn on your cameras and you can take it away. Thank you. I think Melanie is going to get us started. Um, Dr. Kirby, are you there? Is my camera on and my phone? Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Yeah, thank thank you. you. And thank you everyone for attending and thank you for having us present to you. So we'll at, at Sick Kids, we'll there are three of us on for today and we will go through um, just a few um, ways that we're trying to optimize care for children with sickle cell disease. Oh, okay. So the model of care at SickKids. So at SickKids, we have a large um, dedicated sickle cell comprehensive care program. And this is mainly an outpatient uh, in, in the outpatient setting with dedicated people in the in us in sickle, running sickle cell clinics three every week. Our, our inpatient care is managed by the pediatric medicine team when patients come through the emergency room with consultation, uh, with hematology consultation and involvement. Um, we have as part of our multidisciplinary team, we have two nurse practitioners, one of whom is entirely sickle cell disease and one is a transfusions, both thalassemia and sickle cell disease. Two registered nurses, one again, I, um, dedicated to sickle cell disease and the other transfusions and uh, in both areas. We're, we don't have enough social work, 0.5 social worker, which we share with the other 0.5, she's in oncology, but she really does her best to, 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 to uh, provide care to our patients when they need it. We have a clinic coordinator that we share with the rest of the uh, rest of the hematology oncology clinic. We have a clinical research nurse, a transition navigator who will speak to you later, just to talk about the transition navigator, because I know um, members of the Ministry of Health are on, so I have to take this opportunity. This is a, uh, an, an excellent, uh, relatively new position, and we share 0.5 with with uh, sick kids and 0.5 with the UHN. The transition navigator position at the UHN is fully funded by the Ministry of Health, that's our understanding. And it's soft money that uh, funds our, our transition navigator here with us uh, at sick kids. So it's from year to year, it's not, nothing is guaranteed. And this has made such a major impact on our patients transitioning, transferring over to the adult program. We have three hematology physicians who are involved with uh, sickle cell disease care and also with other uh, hematologic condition, uh, clinics. Neuropsychology program, which is 0.2 position. We run, uh, in addition to the three uh, sickle cell kid clinics, we have a newborn screen clinic. We, these babies come out between 40 and 60 every year in Ontario, in our catchment area. And that's nurse practitioner run, uh, Melina is our nurse practitioner. We have access to subspecialists uh, in um, dialysis for apheresis, bone marrow transplant, nephrologists, renal, uh, lung specialists, as many uh, people. They're not physically in our clinic, but our patients go to, go to their clinics. And we try very hard to uh, bundle all of the visits um, in, in the same visit. It doesn't always work that way, but uh, we try as best we can. I'll ask James now to talk about the transition navigator position. 
All right, thanks, Dr. Kirby. Can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay, and I'll just ask for you to forward the slide when I'm ready, okay? Yes, sure. All right, so uh, thanks for having me this afternoon. Uh, my name is James Bradley and I am an occupational therapist and I work as the transition navigator, uh, as Dr. Kirby mentioned. So I, I do work in that role between sick kids uh, in the hemoglobinopathy program and Toronto General Hospital within UHN. Um, so I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about our transition navigator position today, uh, as well as um, some things that we've been working on more recently. So I thought I'd just start off by um, sort of giving you a visual description of what the transition program looks like. So we can see on the slide here, uh, I do start working with patients around the age of 12. So you can see on the yellow bar in the top there is the, um, the patient ages. So during that time, I work on transition preparation skills, uh, which I will go into more detail uh, shortly on the next slide here. We can see at age 18 is when the transfer to adult care occurs. So we, we support patients until they're 18 at sick kids. Uh, and sorry, I didn't mention in the hemoglobinopathy program, I work with patients with both sickle cell disease and thalassemia. So when they do turn 18, that's the, um, the time that we transfer their care to our uh, adult team at Toronto General Hospital. And then I do continue to see them uh, at Toronto General Hospital for one to two years, usually concluding when they're about 20 uh, for that post-transition support. Um, so the, the transition navigator role really does span ages 12 to, to age 20 at the two different healthcare organizations. Next slide, please. All right, so I thought I'd give a list of, um, you know, on, on the last slide I said transition preparation. So that really does break down to quite a few different areas. So I thought I'd spend a bit of time just sort of explaining, um, you know, what, what areas I might be talking to patients and, and their families about in preparation for and, and during the transition period. So we can see here, I, I've started things at age 12 where I, I meet with patients and families to introduce the idea and the concept of transition and that they will transition when they turn 18. Uh, we know that introducing this idea to patients and families at an early age is, is very useful so they can um, start to kind of you know piece together what that might look like for them. So moving on from there between the ages of 12 and 14 uh, we conduct readiness assessments. So these are disease specific assessments that look at things like disease knowledge, um, disease management skills, uh, and also just a patient's comfort level talking about certain topics with their care providers. Um, so, so conducting these between the ages of 12 and 14 allows us to then provide tailored education and support, uh, which is done by the, the various team members that Dr. Kirby mentioned. So some of that might be done by myself. Um, and then of course we have our, our nurses, nurse practitioners, social workers, and hematologists that might be um, uh, implementing that education as well. So moving on from there, I do, I do a lot of conversations with um, young people and their families about um, employment interests, volunteer interests, and then of course career interests as well, and planning for the future. Uh, we do a lot of work around making sure patients are connected to the right supports, both in the high school level, so secondary school, uh, but more recently we've been doing a lot of work making sure that patients that do go off to college and university have access to the appropriate supports, um, which might be something like a, a school accessibility office, um, uh, and, and for other patients that might be looking at work or vocational programs, we also connect them to support with that. Of course, between the ages of you know, 12 to 18 and ongoing, working on health management skills with patients and families. So that's a, a quite a broad sort of umbrella of skills uh, and would be tailored to each patient and family's particular needs. Uh, again, throughout those ages, connecting to any resources families might benefit from, whether those are um, community counseling or mental health resources um, or, or other resources that might, that might be in their local community. Um, you know, I, I might see patients twice or three times a year at the clinic, uh, but making sure they connect to resources that are close to home as well. Of course, at age 18, we do our transition clinic. So this is a joint clinic with the adult provider. So Dr. Richard Ward from Toronto General comes over to sick kids. We do this once a month. Um, so patients and families have a final visit with our sick kids team and they get to meet their, their, uh, one of their new hematologists from Toronto General. Uh, prior to COVID, we would do tours of, the, of Toronto General Hospital as well, uh, which we have not been able to do since uh, COVID started. And then finally, navigating adult care. So this occurs you know, between the ages of 18 and 20, which I, I do find goes by very, very fast. Um, a lot of this is you know, care navigation and really, really learning what the care system looks like. Um, as many people on here know, the, the pediatric care system, um, especially for our patients with sickle cell, um, is, is very coordinated. So, so it's um, you know a lot of appointments on the same day. We take care of a lot of those things. Whereas in the adult care system, it really doesn't work that way. So I do a lot of support with um, connecting patients to to um, you know how how are they navigating their appointments, as well as ongoing support with the things I just mentioned. Next slide, please. Okay. 
So, um, so our, our transition program has been around for about eight years now, four of which I've been a part of the program. Uh, so I thought it'd be important to just to kind of briefly address, you know, how are we evaluating this? How do we know the transition navigator is a, a useful position uh, or is it a useful position? So, of course, the question comes up, how do you measure successful transition? Um, although it seems like a pretty straightforward question, unfortunately, the answer is that it, it's kind of difficult. Um, so there are, you know, there's not one thing you can look at to see if um, a transition to adult care is successful and what does that even mean? So some key measurements that we do look at and we have been tracking since starting uh, the transition program is, of course, patient feedback. So what's the, the lived experience of patients? Uh, we do that through interviews and through surveys, uh, and those are ongoing. So we constantly get feedback from patients and their families about you know, what, what worked well, what didn't work well, uh, what they'd like to learn more about in the future. So of course, the next thing is we, we can look at some of the metrics, some of the numbers, so transition clinics. Um, over eight years, we've done 77 transition clinics with 342 patients uh, that have transitioned to adult care since that time. Um, so we know that looking at, you know, how many of these patients are continuing to connect to care after they've transitioned to the adult system uh, can be one kind of key measurement. Of course, looking at things like adherence to treatment, so whether that be medication adherence uh, or, you know, rec um, sticking to the recommended treatment plan, whether that be monthly blood transfusions or, or other um, so looking at those indicators as well, as well as not only attending sickle cell clinics, but also looking at other specialist appointments. Uh, as we know, our, our patients with sickle cell do see a number of different care providers. And the final one there is quality of life. So this is something that, you know, we've been doing the transition program for eight years now. Uh, so we do have a, a lot of people, 342, that have you know, gone over to the adult care system. So this is something that I really see as our next phase of research, um, and it's actually already underway. So we're going to be looking at patient reported quality of life outcome measures, um, you know, to see what, what the impact of being involved in the transition program has, has led to with more of a quality of life focus. So finally, I'll just talk about some ongoing transition initiatives. So we do always have ongoing clinical quality improvement projects. Uh, an example of this is the post-secondary accessibility supports that I mentioned. So this we worked on a few years ago, uh, and now we, we are sure that every single patient of ours that transitions to university or college is connected with their accessibility office to make sure that they get the right supports in college and university. Uh, we also run patient education groups, uh, and something I'm looking forward to, to maybe um, pursuing a bit in the future is um, helping facilitate some peer support programs. Uh, research and evaluation, so ongoing patient feedback surveys, uh, again, looking at medical outcomes, and then moving forward to more of the quality of life outcome measures as well. And that, that's all for me today, so I'll pass it back to Dr. Um, Kirby and Dr. Fuller. Thank you. So well, I, th I think this, we're very proud of this program, and, and it's a program that we'd like to see duplicated in, in other, uh, other big, the other uh, comprehensive care centers, pediatric going to adults. What James hasn't said is that we, we know that in transitioning for, to adult care, we historically and in many other set, settings, it's, it's well known in the literature, we lose patients from pediatrics to adults. And, and the highest, historically, the highest cause of uh, age of death between 18 and 25, because people fall out of care when they leave pediatric care. Um, a few things are very different. One thing he mentioned was um, was pa patients in pa the pediatric center. We tend to put together all the appointments. We get behind people to come. Parents are involved and parents bring their children. When young people leave us at 18, that's a time of starting college, university jobs. There's so many other competing things. And suddenly our, our, our 18 year olds have to start advocating for themselves, have to make note of their appointments, have to keep their appointments because parents then start giving them a little bit more independence and things fall apart sometimes. So this, this program has, James hasn't said it, but our follow-up is, 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 is significantly improved in the adult program in those patients who are transitioned um, through, this, through this program. The other thing not to, not to forget so that everybody's aware, there's a, an education a session coming up on transition to uh, university and for our post, post secondary education. And that's in collaboration with uh, the Sickle Cell Awareness Group, SCAGO, um, every, every year. And that's done, yeah, it'll be done uh, shortly. Um, so I wanted to, us to highlight this, this program. We, we've, we've run our, trans, our comprehensive care program for, for many years now, um, probably close to 25 years or more. 
but there we we can still always do better in our program we're not perfect so we always look at ways of doing better back in 19 uh in 2016 17 um, the hospital looked at readmission rates of, of sickle cell patients and many other uh, cr uh, chronic illness patients and, and airmarked sickle cell disease was one, one group of patients that were having significant readmission rates. At that time, our readmission rate was about 18%. Readmission as this um, definition of within a month, uh, within 28 days of, of a discharge. Um, from the hospital as a readmission rate, and someone in administration decided that we should have a we should get down to fourteen percent readmission rate. At that time, also in the United States in the literature, it was about sixteen percent. So we were aiming very high, a lower percentage rate, and that led to this program, which Dr. Fuller will talk about, uh, um, a scope called Scope. Hi everyone. So um, I. I'm a general pediatrician, so uh, most of the time I meet children with sickle cell, children and youth with sickle cell disease when they um, come into the hospital and need to be admitted for any reason. So that's the, the lens that I bring today. But I'll be talking about this interdisciplinary working group that started um, just as I was arriving back to sick kids for my training. So I, um, Dr. Kirby has been giving me the, the tour. Um, so this program came together with um, a goal of bringing together all the different healthcare providers in the hospital that care for children with sickle cell disease. And the target really was this um, readmission rate, as Dr. Kirby mentioned, um, but the goals of this program, I think, um, really reached beyond that to all the different things that can lead to um, suboptimal care for children and youth with sickle cell disease, which definitely th that care is something that can drive readmission. Um, so the program brought together representation across the department, so um, that includes emergency medicine, who unfortunately are at their major conference today, or else they would be here with us as well, uh, pediatric medicine, the pain team, and of course, hematology, who provides the, the, the comprehensive care, uh, both inpatient and outpatient settings. Um, we included a representation from the different health professions, which included physicians, nurses, pharmacy, and then um, our hospital's quality improvement and safety team, um, and the clinical and the administrative domains to ensure that we are capturing you know, all the different perspectives of the hospital. Next slide, please. So as Dr. Kirby mentioned, um, the goal was to reduce readmission um, within one month of discharge from 18 to 14%. And the main approach was to uh, reduce variation in care. Um, so that Im involved Im implementation of a variety of care packages to ensure consistency and to improve the transition home, to implement bundled services to high-risk patients, um, and then to prevent the symptoms and illness that lead to admission and readmission in the first place. Okay, next slide. So there were a variety of clinical initiatives that resulted from that and have been evaluated, implemented, and reevaluated since. And I'm going to provide an overview. And then during the question and answer period, I think Dr. Kirby and I are happy to provide more, more details. Um, so some of these included the introduction of a variety of clinical practice guidelines that have been implemented across the patient care environments. Um, so these were reviewed by the multidisciplinary working group, updated, there was education provided to the care providers responsible for, for patient care in these settings. Um, and these included care plans and practice guidelines for presentation with fever to the ED, um, to pain management, and to our approach to um, uh, acute chest crisis. Um, we implemented a standardized pain management program post-discharge called a pain plan, and, and that's really helped with ensuring that there's a smooth transition from the inpatient pain management program uh, sort of plan of action to um, how things look when patients go home. Um, we implemented modules for ongoing education for trainees and nurses about pain management. Um, and then in some cases, um, care plans for individual patients where we found that maybe our clinical practice guidelines need some more specific information so that when they present to the emergency department um, or get admitted to hospital, some, some details about their previous clinical trajectories or um, effective interventions in the past are, are well known from the beginning so that we can help provide the best care. 
Um, and then some systematic education. And as a trainee, I think I was on the receiving end of some of this and really remember it well um, to nurses, to physicians, um, to trainees, particularly about hydroxyurea. And you know, I've noticed as a result of this, our residents who really ask about hydroxyurea when patients come into hospital. And I hear about this now as the inpatient attending, even when it's not directly related to the reason for admission, everyone is thinking about it all the time. So I think that was uh, a really nice program. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, looking back at that program, um, we, we really appreciated the, the fact that this multidisciplinary working group brought everyone together and led to some relationship building across the organization. So bringing together the inpatient ambulatory and ED settings. Um, and, you know, for example, even still, there's more work to be done because I didn't know all the details of that amazing transition program. Um, it, it sounds really incredible. Um, so we, we developed an engaged stakeholder group to address issues in a timely manner. Um, we focused on standardized practice and best practices. Um, and then as a, in order to make sure that we had the perspective of lived experience, we um, now have a patient or a parent representative actually on our hematology oncology patient advocacy committees that we ensure that we are, we're hearing the perspectives of patients and parents. Um, challenges, you know, specific to this program, we found that, you know, we're, we're able to bring people together within the hospital setting, but there's a lot of complexity involved in um, developing integrated partnerships with external agencies. So CCAC was one example, if we need um, home care nursing or other interventions to be done, like physiotherapy or occupational therapy in the home, um, that has taken some practice. And I know it's, I think, one actually upshot of the, of the pandemic in some way that some more automated processes are coming into place to make that happen. Um, I'll just highlight, you know, not specific to this program, but Dr. Kirby and I were talking about one other challenge is sort of integrating, uh, like engaging patients in virtual care when that's our option. So we can talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our, our next steps include, um, you know, we've been talking about where we're going to go from here now that we've had some evaluation of that scope program. So we're going to do a look back on um, all those care plans and practice guidelines that were implemented and see if um, a year or two later after the pandemic has thrown a wrench in everything, especially if we're still um, adhering to those and if they're still working um, for, our, for our patients. Um, we're reconvening our working group, um, and I think in some ways inspired by the summit and the feedback that we received to um, determine if there are other quality metrics that we can um, evaluate going forward on an ongoing basis. Um, we're going to continue to recruit patients and parents interested in participating in care improvement activities. Um, and I think that the last step is learning more maybe in a systematic way through research um, as opposed to just quality improvement about patient and family lived experience to see if um, that can help us, you know, think about other strategies for improving patient care um, in the, you know, the three domains in the hospital, the ED, the inpatient setting and the outpatient setting that, that they're receiving care in the hospital. I think that that's it. And Dr. Kirby, please feel free to add anything that I, I missed in there. Yes, one, um, and, you know, COVID really has put up a, a block because our focus then went not away from patients, but in a different way. But one of the, the follow-up after, we were following after the scope optimization program, we were following the percentages of, of readmissions. And we actually at one month, we got one, one, we did it in quarters. One quarter, we got down to 12% readmission rate. We haven't looked for a little while, definitely not through the last two years. And that's something that we, we will have to look at again. Um, and, and it's something we keep, should keep doing ongoing. And look, look as, as um, Dr. Fuller had said, continue looking at, at all the other things that we did. That, that um, multidisciplinary group Actually, we, we spent so many hours in this room over over like a year to get a lot of things done. And it was it was actually very gratifying to pull everybody together. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Kirby, Dr. Fuller, James, and all of the Kids crew. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, and we know that you are one of the programs that uh, I know the pediatric families are so saying, sick case is good, but thank you that you are still making efforts to improve um, you know, your uh, program. Thank you very much. So our last presenter for this segment is Dr. Derek Chan. Dr. Chan is a pediatric resident, 
physician scientist at British Columbia Children's Hospital with a research background in stem cell biology and interest in non-malignant blood disorders, including sickle cell disease and bone marrow failure. So he is on this uh, uh, summit today because previously he completed his PhD training at McMaster University where he worked with Dr. Madeline Elsek in his clinical years to initiate a province-wide study of sickle cell disease quality of care in emergency departments across Ontario. And the SCAGO is very proud uh, to be one of the sponsors of this study. And we thought it would be very uh, appropriate for him to uh, present this study today. Uh, Dr. Derek Chen, over to you. Hi, Lonry. Thanks for that introduction. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak a little bit about our work. Um, I just want to begin by saying that it's been a real pleasure uh, to listen to all the stories from patients and then participate in the dialogue to improve sickle cell disease care during these two days over the summit. And so I hope to do it a little bit of justice by providing this sort of a capstone talk on our work here that looked at the quality of care for sickle cell disease in the emergency department across the province. Um, the authors that you see listed here have no relevant conflicts of interest to declare. And um, I am mindful of time, so I'm hoping to also cover this as much as possible uh, while balancing clarity as well while I go through the presentation. This work was really inspired by the clinical handbook um, that Dr. Verhovsek had presented to us yesterday. And this study was really meant to bear, uh, was meant to bring further data to bear on three main questions. One was where is the burden of care for sickle cell disease in the emergency department? Two, are there identifiable disparities in sickle cell disease ED care? If so, what are their their determinants. And then finally, three, where should or can we focus future interventions to improve the quality of care for sickle cell disease? To provide you a framework on our approach for the study, we first established the entire sickle cell disease cohort that presented with vaso-occlusive crises uh, through a health administrative data approach by pulling uh, data using the ICD code of D57.0. We then looked at establishing independent cohorts for comparison purposes that were matched on a variety of criteria. In these bubbles and below, you'll see that we had two tiered approaches for matching, um, one where we compared sickle cell disease to the general ED population that were made similar by age, sex, residential area, the neighborhood income quintile, and the date range of the ED visit. We didn't stop there and we did a second comparison by looking at sickle cell disease with another acute on chronic disease entity called Crohn's disease that invariably at some points could present in the emergency department with a painful component. So looking at the tables below, you'll see the N numbers for the number of patients that we were able to capture using this matched approach. And in the subsequent slides, I will be able to show you our matched uh, comparisons for match number one between sickle cell disease and the general population, as well as in match number two, sickle cell disease versus Crohn's disease. And either in 2A or in 2B matched approaches, we were able to get in the thousands to hundreds, hundreds and thousands of uh, N numbers for comparison. And as this data has yet to be published, I would like to respectfully ask that um, this data would not be publicly shared um, uh, without permission. So from a um, cohort to cohort perspective, we first looked at the entire sickle cell disease cohort population that presented with vaso-occlusive crisis. And starting on the left side here, you see that the representation for uh, more than 2,000 patients in this cohort were a little bit more female compared to male, but within the emergency department setting, uh, we saw the little bit of a flip where males were a bit more represented compared to females. From adult to pediatric, we saw about a 60 to 40 or 70 to 30 split in the patient representation, and a vast majority of these patients are living in urban environments. In the top graph, you'll see that the annual ED visit rate has been calculated, and you can appreciate that from 2006 to 2018, the average ED visit rate for patients among this cohort really increased steadily from about three uh, visits per year all the way until 2018, which was about 14 visits per year. And from a cohort to cohort perspective, looking at the first graph here on the bottom left, you'll see that for the maroon bars, which represent the higher triage scores of CTAS 1 or 2, there is a larger representation 
representation of higher triage scores that sickle cell disease incurs compared to the general population, as well as in comparison to Crohn's disease. When we look at what the time of duration when patients are waiting in the emergency department to be seen by a doctor, by general, uh, even though with the same triage scores, we are uh, seeing a, a significant difference where the sickle cell disease cases are being seen a little bit earlier by about 10 minutes or 15 minutes compared to the general population or to Crohn's disease. When we look at the disposition from the emergency department of either being admitted thereafter or being discharged, we see a larger proportion of patients with sickle cell disease being admitted to hospital compared to these control groups. And then in the longer term of the annual ED visits, we see that within a one year period, there is a significant 10 plus year representation of visits per year in the sickle cell disease cohorts compared to our other control groups. We then conducted some subgroup analyses and we looked within the sickle cell disease populations and compared them to our control groups. What we most prominently found was that adult patients with sickle cell disease have a greater burden of need and are not receiving equal or recommended treatment for in the ED compared to pediatric patients. Starting on the left side of being in the ED, you'll see that a large ED visit rate burden is really found within the sickle cell disease population of about average of six visits per year, and that is a 2.5 fold change difference over the pediatric patient population. This is definitely not the case in the general population, and yet again we see a greater fold change when we made our second comparison of sickle cell disease versus the Crohn's disease population of showing that the burden is really highest among the adult populations. We then looked at triage scores and we found that for an N number and within the study, within the thousands, we found it quite significant that um, the adult patients with sickle cell disease receive a lower proportion of higher triage scores of CTAS 1 or 2 compared to their pediatric uh, um, components, uh, counterparts. And this pattern was not present within the general population and um, was still present a little bit within the Crohn's disease population. When we looked at the time that patients were waiting to be seen by a doctor in the emergency department, we saw a significant disparity between adult and pediatric patients with sickle cell disease. Adults here waited significantly longer compared to pediatric patients. We definitely do not see the same extent within the general population, and this significance remains even when we compare sickle cell disease compared to Crohn's disease here. What's interesting to also note from this graph is that uh, when we look at adult to adult comparisons, pa adult patients with sickle cell disease are waiting about the same time when we compare um, uh, head to head with the adults in the general population. But what's really driving the signal of, of disparity in care is that the pediatric patients with sickle cell disease are being seen much sooner compared to the adult counterparts as well as even kids within the general population. Within the ED department, in terms of the time that's spent there, adults again are being seen, uh, are spending a lot more time within the emergency department compared to pediatric patients. This is definitely not the same extent in the general population. And again, not the same case when we um, compare it to Crohn's disease as well. From the disposition advantage standpoint, we see that a, a less proportion of the adult patients with sickle cell disease end up being admitted to hospital compared to pediatric patients. This is not found in the general population. And again, this is not found in Crohn's disease. For the length of stay when, if among the admitted patients, we see that adults with sickle cell disease remain admitted longer compared to pediatric patients. This is not the same extent in the general population. And we didn't have enough N numbers to really make or um, a, a similar sort of a discovery within our Crohn's disease comparison. And finally, in the longer picture of looking at the return to ED, we see that the repeat ED visits rate, ED visit rates uh, within either a 14-day window or a 30-day window is significantly uh, shown here for adults uh, with sickle cell disease compared to pediatrics. This is not the same extent in the general population. And again, significantly so not the same extent within the Crohn's disease population. Longer term in the annual ED visit rate, what we found was that the 10 plus bracket of patients were definitely overly represented in the adult patients with sickle cell disease compared to pediatrics. And by and large, it was really hard to find patients that had that same sort of bracket within the general population and in Crohn's disease as well. 
We also looked at uh, sex as a, a potential determinant. And what we found was that male, uh, male patients with sickle cell disease experience shorter stays in the emergency department and hospital compared to females, but their return rates are significantly higher. We see that their time they spend in the emergency department of males over females, they spend less time in the emergency department, not the same extent in the general population, and that this is also uh, generally trended uh, to be the case within our second comparison. And for the disposition from ED standpoint, for an N number into the thousands, this is still remains quite significant that males are less likely to be admitted compared to females. This is not the case in the general population. And again, not the case in the Crohn's disease population. For the length of stay in hospital, males are uh, staying less um, in the hospital compared to females. Um, this is about the same in the general population, but again, more significant when we made our second comparison to Crohn's disease. And in the longer term, we found that the repeat ED visit rates for males are significantly higher compared to females for sickle cell disease, not the same case in the general population, not the same case for Crohn's disease. And in the annual ED visit range, we see a slight um, uh, over representation of 10 plus brackets in the black bars uh, within the male uh, cohort um, with sickle cell disease compared to females and definitely hard to compare with the general population and hard to compare with Crohn's disease. We also looked at income uh, neighborhood quintiles. Uh, and what we found is that the low income neighborhoods uh, in sickle cell disease correlate with a lower acuity triage score and is a distinct risk factor for repeat ED visit rates. Looking at the graph on the left side, on the x-axis, you'll see that the neighborhood income quintiles are plotted with one being the poorest among the quintiles and five being the most richest in the quintiles. And we see that in our comparisons of sickle cell disease versus general or sickle cell disease versus Crohn's disease, there is a heavier ED visit rate within the uh, lowest neighborhood income quintile that we looked at. And interestingly, in the emergency department, we also saw a correlation with triage score. So patients with a lower income quintile as represented by one, generally uh, were less likely to receive a higher triage score of CTAS one or two, and that this steadily improved as you went up in terms of your neighborhood income quintile. This pattern was not found in the match general uh, population here, nor was it actually found in, in the Crohn's disease cohort as well. And then in the longer term of re returning to the ED, we saw a heavier uh, burden of, uh, of needing to come back to the ED within the lower income neighborhood quintile populations of sickle cell disease here compared to the general population where it's not to the same extent. And we see the same pattern where the absolute degree of repeat visits is certainly higher in sickle cell disease compared to the Crohn's disease population. We also see this correlation in the annual ED visit rates for the lower income neighborhood quintiles compared to the highest bracket. We barely see this within our control groups. And then what was interesting uh, was that we also find that within the highest bracket of uh, high users of ED uh, visits, we found that the high annual ED visit rates in sickle cell disease are significantly less often repeat visits compared to the general population. So when we categorize visits as either zero to three times a year, four to nine times a year, or more than or equal to 10 times a year, certainly a proportion of the highest proportion of 10 visits a year could be explained partially by the repeat visits um, in the emergency department. But when we compare to the match population uh, of the general uh, ED population, a large proportion of the sickle cell disease population uh, of coming uh, that many times throughout the year isn't necessarily explained by our catchment window of either 14 days or 30 to days compared to the general population, which uh, really suggests that they are very distinct uh, visits uh, that are spread throughout the year. And then we finally found that uh, triage scores may act as an example structural mechanism to improve the ED quality of care for sickle cell disease among adult patients. You can see in these graphs here for the time that they wait to be seen by a doctor, it certainly steadily improves as the patients are received, uh, that receive a higher triage score and that there is a correlation when we look at their likelihood of being admitted or discharged from the hospital with a higher triage score. Repeat visits are certainly less among those who have a higher triage score, and that in the annual ED visits rate, we also see a correlation where less of them in the higher triage score group will likely uh, be within that group of 10 plus per year.
So in conclusion, we found through this study uh, very systematically that disparities in sickle cell disease VOCED care remain present in Ontario for a universal and publicly funded healthcare system, and that the quality of care received in clinical outcomes for specific subgroups of patients uh, within this group, most prominently among adults, but also among those more vulnerable within this patient population, raises concern from a health equity perspective. And so from now, the landscape of sickle cell disease care um, needs to really be addressed for to address these gaps from a policy standpoint, from a clinical standpoint, and from a variety of research efforts in the future to make sure that we can provide better care for everybody. And while the absence of race-based data in our databases really limits our ability to assess for existence of racialized disparities, our matched cohort comparisons lend specificity to those that were identified in sickle cell disease here and highlights the need for inclusion of such data in our systems in order to provide consideration of needs for vulnerable populations. So I hope that this future work will really uh, build on this foundation of this data for our province for more than over the last decade. And I'm really happy to present uh, this update to uh, this group here. And we're happy to take feedback either by QR code and I will uh, paste this link as well in our chat. So thank you very much. I wanted to briefly thank Madeline Verhovsek for really giving me the opportunity to help lead this work here. We have established a brief research brief uh, to circulate to the Skagel community on the left side that will come out shortly. And again, here is the QR code on the right side to provide feedback, as well as the link to provide feedback on this work. This work was uh, not possible without funding supports from Skago, as, as was mentioned, as well as from funding supports from the Division of Hematology and Thromboembolism at McMaster University. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions with the rest of the panelists. Amazing. Thank you, Dr. Derek Chan, for that um, eye-opening, um, very detailed, descriptive um, research study that um, you, you and the team have, um, have initiated. Um, we feel very much enlightened by that, just understanding um, the demographics, understanding the burden that lies, um, understanding how it all encompasses um, into contributing towards, um, you know, the, the patient's outcome in the end. So we appreciate all of that very detailed study that you've shared with us. Um, so now we'd like to invite all of our panelists who are part of the afternoon session. Um, feel free to put your cameras on and we would like to open the floor up for questions. So this is our question and answer period. Um, and uh, if you would like, I want to encourage all our guests and all our um, friends on the line today, please put your questions in the Q&A chat or in the general chat and we will get to them. But first, um, just to start off, um, I have a question for our team and I know um, anyone can feel free to answer this, but I know it was mentioned by um, our, our Sick Kids team. Um, Dr. Anfal, I know you mentioned that there is quality metrics that are, are being used. So I'm just wondering, like, how are you determining, like how is the team um, determining this quality metrics for evaluating patient care going forward? Um, I would assume it's a, a consolidation of, of what you mentioned, like this, the clinical practice guidelines, you're encompassing research studies, um, knowing the challenges and how you're approaching them. So I'm just wondering, what are you, um, what is the team using for like distinguishing and understanding um, the quality metrics that need to be instituted for, um, I guess, uh, best practice in terms of care of the patients coming in? Dr. Kirby, do you want to start that one? And then I'll, I can add as we go since you're part of the room. So it, we, for the last two years during the pandemic, we've, things are not been going the way that they had started. But shortly after the, 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 the scope optimizing program was put in place, there was ongoing with, with the help. So a lot of the, the detailed, um, the proper words for using some of these things, I don't, I, I, I follow along with our quality improvement team, but they we, we would meet and the quality, quality improvement team would continue looking at readmission rates, um, for example, and give us every quarter and give us a report back. What we looked at, what, what, is, what is very clear, and Dr. Fuller had mentioned it, what is very clear is that the education within the inpatient service. So a lot of her colleagues who were residents at the time are now staff physicians. And so the, the, this, the, this current generation of staff physicians is much more educated about a sickle cell disease and, and, and management. And that has come from 
uh, uh, five five years leading up to this of increase in education and 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 to, to everyone. I, and I just want to add one thing that um, Dr. Carolyn Beck, she couldn't be here today, but was a part of preparing this presentation and is our um, inpatient director for pediatric medicine. You know, one of one of the points we've been talking about is actually defining quality metrics. So not that we have a list of quality metrics, but that, you know, our next step as a group is actually to, we had some initial ones that were part of that scope um, working group, but now thinking going forward, what are additional quality metrics? How do we define them? Um, and, and that being the first step towards deciding, you know, QI interventions and um, measurement of those quality metrics. So I think, you know, we're even starting, some of them are obvious that, that we've already discussed, but some of them are, are ones that we don't know exist yet out there, but that that's going to be a part of that, you know, the, those next steps that I mentioned, you know, those will be information gathering to help inform what, what our next stage of quality metrics will be. And obviously best practices can inform that kind of thing, but we're thinking about go, you know, going beyond that and thinking a bit more broadly. Look, looking not only readmission, but look, starting from, from the way we, we started with looking at the emergency experience, emergency room experience and the, um, the repeat visits to emerge, the length of stay in emerge, the, um, sorry, the, um, the time to first antibiotic, for example, and time to first analgesia and then the follow-up analgesia. So there's a lot of things that need to be looked at at the moment. Okay. And just a follow-up to that question, just knowing all of these different aspects, every patient coming in um, has, a, has a unique story, has a unique, I guess, care plan, right? Um, so for just, just knowing that, does that add another level of, of difficulty in terms of you layering on all of these different things for your metric system moving forward? getting the patient the patient perspective the patient narrative also will be part of part of looking at how we're doing because we we can we can look at numbers but if the patients are not feeling like they're getting good care and adequate care then then it's it doesn't matter so and i th i think to add to that you know there's always the the lens that we tend to take in health research when we're thinking about health equity and healthcare equity that looks at deficits and what's missing. And then I think there's another lens that we can apply as we learn the patient experience and implement going forward. You know, what are the strengths that exist and how do we how do we learn about what resources patients and families are drawing? Where are their sources of resilience and how can we integrate that aspect in, into the care that they receive as well? Because, and I think that's one of the really unique things that every child and family brings that, you know, their sources of support and the strengths that they have to draw on and we can do it on a case-by-case -case basis clinically but I, I think that there are high level lessons to be learned about um, the strengths that that families have when they're coping with a chronic condition like sickle cell disease that can help us so there's you know the medical perspective where we have this level of metrics that we always think of and then obviously there's the 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 whole life that goes on when, when we're not there so I think both, both need to be taken into account, but I think a strengths-based approach, you know, could also add some value here. And that's something that I'm interested in personally. Amazing, absolutely makes sense. Thank you so much for that. Um, just understanding of, of just, you know, the direction you see moving forward. Um, I'd like to pass it over to Ms. Lanry for um, facilitating other questions. Um, yes, we will look in the uh, Q&A box and in the chat box, but before we look at the other questions, I wanted to ask the UHN team, especially, um, in your presentation, you had uh, provided that about 52% or so um, of the people that uh, you, you know, that were, that, I believe in the survey that Marcos has shared, about 52% um, of the people who are part of that survey um, were provided opioids before uh, a doctor's assessment. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that, um, given that many of the hospitals that I have interacted with um, do not um, think that um, patients should be provided with opioids without the MD um, given the okay force. I just wanted to know if there's something we can all learn from that practice that you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for that, Lanre. 
Um, maybe I can give a, a little bit of the MD perspective, but I think more importantly is going to be to hear from Ruth on this. Yeah. Um, so Ruth is a, a fierce nurse to have on your side if you come to the emergency department and you're having pain related to sickle cell. Um, so what Ruth will do, um, and um, I, I can say from my perspective, is she will come and she will find me um, and she will say, you know, hey, um, you know, Ms. X is here and she's having bad pain here is the order set this is what she usually gets I know you know that we're this many hours behind but I really want to get her started on stuff um, and so the the fact that we um, in that you know in that baseline data um, we're having um, folks get analgesia before their actual you know physician initial assessment time really comes down to um, to great work by um, by nurses like Ruth um, it is a very difficult um, uh, uh, topic. It is a controversial topic. Um, we are uh, not able still to start um, opioids before um, someone has a, a, a spot inside the eMERGE, and we all know how bad our wait times are. So a lot of people are just, you know, are, are out in triage waiting to come into the eMERGE. Um, so we're, we're definitely still facing barriers. Um, uh, but, um, but yeah, but when it, it works, um, when it works, it works well. So Ruth, I'll, I'll let you speak to that. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Um, that's a great question, Landry. Um, we are focusing on emphasizing with triage and the, and the primary nurse. The moment we have a patient come in with sickle cell pain crisis, especially, for example, when I am in triage, um, I do tend to ask the patient, what are their regular dose of medication that they take? and what are their breakthrough dose that they take so that when I go and get that actual order set and give it to the physician, I'm not only just asking for the standard two milligrams or four milligrams of hydromorphone. I'm saying they take, for example, 18 milligrams of hydromorphone and take four milligrams as a breakthrough. This patient needs a little bit more medication. Can you give me an order? And then we initiate it right away. We are pushing to let triage and the primary nurse work together. And what we're working on doing is actually having the order set at triage already printed at in the triage room so that when they bring the patient into the room the primary the triage nurse tells the primary nurse at this patient is having a sickle cell pain crisis i'm going to talk to the doctor to get the order set ready for you get an iv in so that we can at least match the time and work in unison so that by the time the iv is already established someone's already mixing the pain medication and it's starting we are holding each other accountable. I can tell you that much. As Dr. Ryan said, I am fierce to work with. I am. So we are working with holding people accountable. I do check when I come into work, if we have patients um, with sickle cell pain crisis, I do check when was the time they got their analgesia. If it's been more than three hours, I'm filing an instant report. We're getting management and we're, we're trying to escalate it so that this conversation is being started. And not only file an incident report, I do talk to my colleagues and say, you know what, I hold them accountable. This patient's coming with pain, Medicaid pain crisis. We need to start something so that they have a better understanding. We need more than just empathy. We need to have compassion as well for our patients. And I always say we have to keep that same energy. If it was our family member, we would not, we would advocate for them. If it was our friend, we would advocate for them. So we need to take the time to remember that they are one of us. We are all human beings. We all go through pain. We need someone to be there for them. And what can we do to make sure that, you know, they're getting the adequate pain medication that they need? I hope I was able to answer your question. Yes, that was, that was, that was good. That, that was, that was powerful. And, and I want to thank you and your team at UHN for that. I also want to um, thank Dr. Derek Chan because he has provided us with amazing study to help us see even compared to Crohn's disease and other um, diseases and disorders, um, our sickle cell disease is faring when it comes to the emergency department. This clearly shows that we have so much work to to mm -hmm. do, you know, there's so much more to be done. Before we, we get to the closing remarks, we're getting to the end of it. I wanted to ask all the panelists to kindly have their camera on and Carla will take a picture of the have to know panelists. But while that is going on, I cannot help but note in the chat box, um, some comment from Dr. Deji Ayori Day. Uh, this man is actually a psychiatrist, uh, and he was one of the um, 
moderators for yesterday's session, but he did put something in there that I thought is, I would like to read out to everybody. He, he, uh, the acronym is PREMS, P-R-E-M-S. And it said P is for physical pain, protocols, patients. And he has more stuff there, but I'm just stopping there. You can read in the chat, it's there too for everybody. HAR is for respect, race, resources. E is for empathy, emotion, equity, education. M is for mental health, mentorship, management. S is for systemic issues, mm -hmm. stigma, stress, support, sensitivity. He, and he even had a schedule. S is for schedule as well. I want to thank you, Dr. Yorinde, for that. I think you really, really sum mm -hmm. it up for us very nicely. Um, you know, we need to respect. Sickle cell is about pain. And he also has mental health and there, and there are systemic issues that we need to be working on. There's stigma, there's stress, there's support. And schedule, get to work, more advocacy. <laughs> Thank you so much, that was amazing. So I would also like to um, use this moment to thank every member of the Skego research team, because without the research study identifying the hospitals in need of education um, to support patients with sickle cell disease in the province, we won't be here today. So mm -hmm. that study led to today. So I want to thank every one of you. Most of you are still on the call, Dr. Susan Williams, Dr. Melanie Kobe. Um, we have Dr. Madeline Vehovsek, we have um, uh, Mr. Senji Fadwani, um, Dr. Soji Jamitola, Dr. Mami. Um, all of you, I want to thank you um, for, you know, for the amazing job that you've done with the study. I also want to thank all the moderators for the, um, you know, for today um, and for yesterday. You did amazing job moderating these sessions. I mean, you will agree with me that the last two days has been very impactful um, with high opening and program changing presentations, both from the patient communities and the hospitals. So, and I wanna thank every one of you for staying with us. And we hope that you've been, you know, refueled, re-energized to drive equitable care for sickle cell disease forward in Ontario. You see, every one of us has a part to play, not just Kegel and not just the healthcare providers, the patients, you have your part, the, the, you know, the, the, the caregivers, you have your part, you know, and we all need to work together with them. And the Ministry of Health have their part to play. Everyone needs to work together to provide, you know, and do their part. Um, so without taking much more of your time, we have provided some evaluation because we wanted to hear from you on what else you need to do, you need to hear from us what else we need to do, what programs need to be in place, and how should we move forward? So I'm going to ask you to take five minutes and complete that survey that you receive shortly. And so on that note, I will hand it back over to Dr. Dina Powell if there's any other last remarks um, to see. But I'm seeing some comments in the chat box, Dr. Dina. Um, yes. Absolutely. Would you like to look at those? I am. I was just going to mention it, um, Mrs. Lanry. Um, I'm seeing a lot of, of, of our panelists here who are also sickle cell warriors. Um, very grateful for the extent of knowledge and the sensitivity, the empathy that comes with the presentations and the comments and um, just everyone who's spoken today, all of our panelists. I just wanted to read one in particular, if that's okay, um, from Petrina in the chat. Thank you, Ruth, and all the doctors, nurses, and healthcare advocates for being there. More like you will help to make our crisis experience in the emergency department go so, so much better for us. Immediate care helps to make recovery a lot easier and hopefully shortens the duration spent in admission, barring any other complications coinciding with the sickle cell crisis. Thank you. Um, there seems to be a barrage of messages where um, it's a, a united front of gratitude for just the, the level of exposure, the, the improvements that are being made across the board for treatment of patients with sickle cell disease in the ED. So we would love to thank all of our, all of our panelists, um, all of our presenters today. Thank you for your contribution towards improving the care of our patients and um, also the caregivers. And uh, we applaud you for the work that you've done today. So